You fell from the image of God in the garden. The Bible says in the book of Psalm, chapter 69, glory be to God. It says prophetically of Jesus that he restored what he did not take. He, he restored what he did not take from us. We lost our relationship with God. We lost our fellowship with him. And we lost our ability to reflect him because of our disconnection. But Jesus Christ came hmm, to restore that which he did not take away. The devil took away our relationship. He deceived us. But Jesus Christ has given us back that which he did not take. And I want to tell you that we have something called a new age movement. Where they encourage you to make positive affirmations. You know, stand before a mirror and say, I am this and I am that and I will do this and I will that. And I'm telling you, you sound just like the devil. You sound just like the devil in Isaiah where he said, I will ascend above the stars of God. I will be like the most high God. Ironically, there are so many people who want to imitate God in terms of power. But there are very few people who want to imitate God in terms of love. And God wants to bring you there. He wants to bring you unto the perfect man where you become a reflection of his son who is love. So there's a process mm, of you coming unto this man. Christianity is not just a religion. Christianity is not just a relationship. Christianity is a way. Christianity is a way that leads to life, a way that leads to a man. And there's a process that God has prescribed. There's a method that we're supposed to latch onto that enables us to become who it is that God wants us to be. By looking at Jesus, we are supposed to be transformed into his image. But the problem is, in order for you to look at him, you have to be able to see him. And you can't see him unless you are pure in heart. Mm. So Jesus in the Beatitudes, what does he say? He says, blessed are the pure in heart. Why? For they shall see God. Now, the problem with Jesus' ministry, <laughs> especially if you look at the Beatitudes, it seems like Jesus is saying you got to be Christian before you become Christian. Nobody at this time is born again. Jesus Christ has not gone to the cross yet. He just has his disciples, people listening to him, and he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How are you going to be pure in heart if you're not born again? Saints, there are graces that God releases in your life before you come to the foot of the cross. Okay, not everybody who's a non-believer is in the same condition. They're in the same condition in the sense that they're all going to hell. If you didn't know that, know that. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, if you have not accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you are on your way to perdition, to hell. But there are people who are in different stages. There are some people who hate God. There are some people, Bible says that the light shone in the darkness... People love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Just like criminals like to do their deeds in the night, there are people who hate God because God represents light and they resist the light because they don't want to change. There are some people who have had bad experiences in Jesus' name. They've had church hurt and they mistook the pastor for God. And they said, if I can't trust the man of God, I can't trust God. And some people are just looking for a good example to, that would bring them to the foot of the cross. You'd be surprised how many people are disappointed when you mess up. Those of you who profess Christianity in the world, you'd be surprised people who you, you think have nothing to do with God, want no contact with them, but when they see you mess up, they're disappointed. Because deep down in their heart, they want to believe that God works. So you have to see him in order to become like him. People who are pure in heart are also poor in spirit. What does it mean to be pure in heart? To be pure in heart means that you don't have any mixed motives. That the glory of God is not only your foremost ambition, your foremost priority, but it's everything. You don't have anything that's competing. You, your, your life is solidly rooted in him. 
And because you see him for who he is, you become poor in spirit. When you see God, when you really see him, the knowledge of God, the true intimacy with God creates humility. Okay, there are people who have knowledge and they're puffed up. Okay, but that's religious knowledge. When you really in the spirit, true relationship, true contact with God will make you humble. Nothing can make you as proud as religion, but nothing will make you as humble as a true relationship with God. Listen to me carefully. Hmm. So, you become poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Poor in spirit just means you recognize that without God, you can't do nothing. All right, I don't bring nothing to the table. It's all about him. And the tragedy is, man, the tragedy is, is that we have churches. Listen to me. We have churches where the preacher leaves the 99 to get the one every Sunday. In other words, there are people in the church who are truly converted, and they really just want God. They want to hear about Jesus. They want to they come to a true knowledge of him. But in order to placate the one who has not come to the real knowledge of God yet, the one who is still in the flesh, the one who is still carnal, it's all entertainment. The false prophet comes and entertains people to death while God's true sheep, those who really want him, are starving at the vine. Mm. And so, hmm. being poor in spirit, being pure in heart, a commitment to him, a recognition that he is everything, and without him, you can do nothing. Knowing that you don't know it all. Humility. People look at religion as though it's something that you can just choose, you know, based upon your preferences, based upon your desires and predilections. It's like an outfit. If it suits me, I choose it. It's like going to a buffet. I just, I like this kind of food. It suits my desires. Uh, it suits my taste. Uh, it suits the way I think, so I choose it. <laughs> I remember Muhammad Ali, great boxer. Y'all don't know him. Muhammad Ali, he was saying he grew up Baptist, you know, he grew up in the church, uh, uh, but he realized that there was a lot of racism in, in, in Christianity. He went to the church and they made him sit in the back and he made him sit, made him sit far in the back. And so he, he converted to Islam and, and he found a religion that, that suited him, the black power thing. That, that suit, suited him. And I'm like, you can't choose a faith based upon the way you see. <laughs> people talk about my truth. How many of us have heard people talk about this is my truth? I just, I got to speak my piece. I, I got to say my truth. You don't have truth. No, nobody possesses truth. What you have is an experience. What you have is a perspective. If what you have is truth, then what is God supposed to do? If your experience is truth, then what is God, what is his function? His function is to turn, man, the truth is what's supposed to work to reform your experiences, to reform your perspective. In other words, you've been abused, you've been mistreated, people have put you down, and then the truth of God comes, and that restores you. He brings you, one of his ministries is to break, is to, um, to heal the brokenhearted. It's the truth of God that's supposed to deliver you from what you may have experienced. Okay. So anyway, anyway, I got to move on. So, in the book of Luke, in the 8th chapter, Jesus gives what's called the parable of the sower. Somebody say parable. What is a parable? Parable yeah, is a story. It's an illustration. It's a natural picture that's supposed to teach a spiritual truth. Okay? A natural picture, a natural illustration that's supposed to uh, convey a spiritual truth. How many of us heard this expression that a picture is worth a thousand words? Okay? Jesus is, was extraordinary, is extraordinary at painting pictures, all right? He talks about how in the parable of the sower, the sower sows the word. And I really want you to get this because this is real, real important stuff, okay? Jesus said in Mark chapter 4 that if you don't get this teaching, if you don't get this parable, then everything else will be confusing to you. He says, this is a key teaching. He says, if you can master this, you can master all of my teaching. 
But if you don't get this, you're going to be on the outside. So this is real, real important. The sower sows the word. The farmer sows the seed of the word. Hmm. When God created this world, he created plants, he created animals, he created people. All of these things have what's called seed. Okay, The seed is that which is in it that guarantees a future. The seed is the embryo man, that contains life that should germinate to a future. Boy, I hope this is making sense. He says that the word functions as seed. The seed of the word that God sows in your heart is supposed to produce something called revelation. Somebody say revelation. Revelation produces a picture. Man. And this is how you know who it is that's called to teach you. Who it is that God has put in your life to be a teacher to you, to be a preacher to you. Because when you hear them, there's a picture that's produced. Revelation comes. You don't, you don't, see the devil doesn't care. And I know I'm going long. I feel like I'm going to go all day. The devil doesn't care that you go to church. He don't care. He don't mind you going to church as long as you go to a place where you don't receive light. As long as you're at a church where you don't receive revelation that produces a picture that allows you to become who God has called you to become, he's fine with it. He's fine with you being there. Okay? So Jesus gives the parable, and then he says that there are things, okay, there are things that actually stop you from getting the picture. There are things that stop you from getting the revelation. He calls these things thorns. Well, I hope you're following me, okay? Thorns. Go there to Luke chapter 8 really quickly. I want to show it to you. So y'all don't think I'm, I'm just blowing smoke up here. All right, so Luke chapter 8. And the beautiful thing is uh, he explains the parable himself. Okay, we don't have to guess what he means. So we're in Luke chapter 8 verse 14. And he says, And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard, they've heard the word, they go forth and are choked hmm, with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So God's word is coming, but there's something that's competing with it that's stopping it from producing what it's pre-programmed to produce. <sighs> See, some of us are loving to a fault. <laughs> you love too much. You may love God, but you love a lot of things apart from God. And the love that you have for things apart from God is interfering with a pure love for God. Remember, I was watching more. How many of us have watched Maury before? <laughs> and, uh, and they have these overweight babies, sometimes overweight toddlers, sometimes, you know, kids, five, six years old. And they'll have them on stage with diapers on just so you can see how fat they are. Somebody five, six years old with a diaper on just so you can see how big they are. Remember, I saw this one kid, maybe three years old. And kid was huge, man. I mean, just, just mammoth huge. And uh, Maury asked him, uh, kid, what's, what's your favorite food? And he said, broccoli and carrots. And everybody just bust out laughing. I'm feeling bad for the kid. And I'm like, he may not be lying. <laughs> broccoli and carrots may be his favorite food. But he may also love Twinkies. He may also love hot dogs. He may also love pizza, hamburgers. And the love that he has for those things are interfering with what the broccoli and carrots are supposed to do for him. <laughs> if you love things that compete with your love of God, then the love that you have for him will be weakened. Thorns... I feel like I'm not going to get done anytime soon. Are are, can y'all labor with me? Just Can I take my time? I, I got I to gotta explain this to you. Thorns. Thorns choke the word and they are produced by default. If you look at the book of Proverbs chapter 24, Solomon, the wise man, he says that he was looking at a field. He looked at the field of somebody who was slothful. He looked at the field of somebody who was lazy and he learned wisdom. 
because the field wasn't tended to because it was uncultivated thorns were produced thorns are the result of inattentiveness thorns come as a result of carelessness in other words saints if you're not pursuing God then thorns will grow in your heart by default you don't have to look for it it's the natural state of, 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 of the affairs of, of humanity man if you're not search, uh, pursuing him then evil will pursue you and it'll compete with your affection for God well, I hope you I hope you're hearing me <laughs> okay listen 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 People have this impression that if they're not perfect, they can't come to church. I would go to church, but my life, my life isn't where it needs to be. That's religion, okay? In the Old Testament, God was trying to show his majesty. And so if you were a priest, man, <laughs> you couldn't be a priest if you had some type of defect. If you were hunchback, if you had some type of deformity, if you were blind, wouldn't allow you to be a priest. When the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, they, 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 they put a, a rope around his ankle so that if he died there, if there was something wrong with his presentation and his worship, they would drag his body out of there. Why? Because you could die in there. Because God was trying to show his majesty in the Old Testament. But now in the New Testament, because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, the veil has been rent. Now you have a way into the Holy of Holies, and God says, come as you are, and as you pursue him, you become changed. You become transformed. I don't read the Bible because I'm so holy. Listen to me. I don't read the Bible because I'm a holy man. I read the Bible, I pursue the word because I know what I am in the flesh. I don't know what I could become if I chose not to pursue him. And so I make it a priority. It's not... It's not because I'm so holy. It's because if I don't do it, I'm left to myself and I could become something that I never, ever want to be. He says you have to watch the thorns. You have to watch against uh, cares. Be guardful against cares. What are cares? Cares are anxieties. Hmm. Saints, do you know that it's a sin to be anxious? Anxiety is a sin. And I hate to say it that way because I know people have conditions, people have things medically wrong with them. I know that there are genetic things that can be working, but I want you to know that anxiety is not God's will for you. In this society, we look at it like a, like a badge of honor almost, where it's like, well, you know, girl, I got anxiety. It's like a joke, you know. Uh, it's just something cool in a way. But saints, it's not God's will for you to have anxiety in any way, shape, or form. There's some things that we look at as being personality defects when it's a matter of fruit. I used to feel like, well, you know, I'm impatient. You know, that's just how I am. That's just how, that's just how you made me, God. I, I just have these quirks. I, I, I'm impatient in some ways. But how many of us know that patience, long-suffering, is one of the fruits of the Spirit? So I can't attribute it to a personality defect. That's a matter of fruit. If you have God inside of you, what are you anxious for? Can you imagine God up there, afraid, worried, <laughs> scared? No. No. And if, if God's not like that, and you have his spirit, you're not supposed to be like that. There's a preacher that I know of named Bill Johnson. I'm from California, Reading. And he was telling a story. I got to give him credit. He was telling a story about a football player that lost his arm. And um, so he started pursuing tennis. Okay, he, I guess he felt like he could play tennis better than he could football. When I say football, I'm talking about American football, okay, not, not the soccer stuff, whatever. All right, so, <laughs> so he decided he could, he could probably play tennis better than, than football. And he played, and he was extremely, extremely successful. Man, he became champ. And they asked him, how did you become so great? How, how did you overcome all your opponents? And he said, they were playing with two hands. I was only playing with one. They had to choose between their hands. But I had the advantage of only playing with one hand. I didn't have to make that choice. 
and it made him sharper. As you grow as a Christian, as you mature as a Christian, you should get sharper. Your focus should get sharper. It bothers me that pastors are rejected because they're not nicey nice, can't go to every engagement, you know, uh, they're not socialites. People look at me wrong because, you know, you don't have a pastor's heart. You don't want to be here, be there. Look, <laughs> I'm pursuing God. We have a serious role to play as preachers and teachers of the gospel. We are spiritual physicians. You hear me? When a preacher holds the conscience of a human being in his hands. Your eternal condition is predicated upon the word that you receive from a preacher. That takes serious devotion. Not being a blind leader of the blind. <laughs> the friendly doctor is not the doctor who says, hey, looking good, champ. And then you're there to get a heart transplant and he takes out both your lungs. Oops. A friendly doctor is a doctor who's a friend of his profession. A friendly doctor is a, a doctor who knows what he's doing. So when you go to him, you get help. We got to be focused. We got we got to we got to addict ourselves to this walk. Pastors, preachers, Christians, we have to addict ourselves to this work. It's so desperately important. So what do you do? You have anxiety? What do you do? He says be anxious for nothing. But do what? Pray. <laughs> you pray. You pray about it. That's all you gotta do. You pray about it. Be anxious for nothing. What is Jesus' cure for anxiety? He says, who can add? You can't add a cubit to your stature by being anxious. He just gives you a logical reason. <laughs> he just gives you logic. You can't grow. You can't do anything fruitful by worry. So what do you do? You sow. Okay? You sow. You don't think about what you don't have now. Listen to me. Don't think about what you don't have now. Don't think about what you can't do now. Focus on what you can do now so you can have something later. That's what Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 11. He says, he that observes the winds shall not sow. He that regards the clouds shall not reap. He that's, man, hallelujah. He that's more focused on what he can't control than what he can control won't have anything. How many of us know you can't control people? Amen? You can't control people. Man of God was telling me that he was, he was raking the leaves one day. He was, he was raking. He was raking. He was, he was trying to get everything where it was supposed to be in his yard. And the wind came and blew the leaves everywhere into his neighbor's lawn. And he said, God spoke to him in that moment. He said, son, you can't control the leaves because you can't control the winds. You can't control people. You can't control how people respond to you. You can't control if people reject you or accept you. But what you can do is get yourself rightly geared in God and do what you can. So now and eventually you, well, my baby don't got no daddy. He, he don't got no daddy at home. Well, whatever you would want a father to teach your baby, you teach him. Some of the best men that you'll find are raised by, now it's not optimal, <laughs> trust me, it's not optimal, but some of the best men that you'll find are those raised by single mothers who took it upon themselves to do what they could. Okay, and so I'm, you also have the problem of pleasures. Look, verse 14, he says, cares, riches, and pleasures of this life because of pleasures of this life, they bring no fruit to perfection. They don't become the person that God wants them to be because they're addicted to their pleasures. Now, God wants you to have pleasure. He, he's not against you having pleasure. He's not against you having fun. But he wants to be the primary person that pleases you. You were made for God's pleasure. 
And God wants to be the one who is the primary agent and source of pleasure in your life. I remember I used to be addicted to video games. Now, it ain't, can I tell you, it ain't no sin to play video games, okay? <laughs> it's not a sin to play video games. I think it's stupid. You're 49, 50 years old, and you spend most of your free time playing games. I think there's something wrong with you mentally. But you may not go to hell for, because you're playing video games. You're sinning against your own destiny and your own future, but I think you can make heaven still when you're playing video games and being not productive. I believe you, you can still make it to heaven. But anyway, anyway, I remember I was addicted to video games. There was this game uh, called uh, Street Balls, NBA Street Balls, something like that. And I, <laughs> I had a teammate, and every time I passed him the ball, he would just shoot it. Every time we give him the ball, he shoot. So we just made up our mind, we're not going to pass to this kid no more, okay? And uh, eventually, I just lost it. He was getting rebounds, and he was shooting and doing all types of crazy stuff. And I, I just, I, I, I went in. I just, I said, man, you, you are so stupid, man. You, you don't know why you're playing this game. Just uninstall this game. And you know what that, that kid said to me? He said, I'm on six years old and I said man I gotta pull back <laughs> this is going too far man I'm, I'm tripping man I need to I need to stop pursuing something this this is this is taking too big of a hold on my life I had to just kind of recalibrate myself see it's okay to have pleasure <laughs> but you don't want the pleasures of this life this material life to be primary you want to have God please you I, my, my, my uncle called me, and he said he wanted me to come to California just for a weekend. And I'm like, for what? I don't want to go to California. I don't want to. Why? Because I have a rhythm. I have a pattern of life in the Word of God, and this stuff makes me happy. I don't want to go somewhere and interrupt that flow. Why? Because this, this, this is life to me, man. I, I love this stuff, man. This is not, I remember my birthday, my mother called me, asked me, what are you doing for your birthday, son? I said, I'm just reading the Bible. And she sounded so disappointed. Like, she felt so bad for me. I'm like, man, I don't, I can't think of nothing better to do, man. Where else, where else can I go? For in Christ, I find the words of eternal life. I get life. I get energy, man. I get, I rejoice in this stuff, man. This stuff is gold to me. And having this attitude, having this mindset that Jesus Christ is primary, it, it, it doesn't function by position. It's not because you're a preacher or a pastor. I know missionaries, whenever they talk to me, they want to talk to me about sports. There are people who choose mission work because they're actually hiding from their real function. Okay? They're hiding from what God has called them to do, and they think they can use missionary work as a shield. Who do you love? What do you love? Why are you doing what you're doing? What do you delight in? The greatest index of your character is what you delight in. Is the Word of God, is reading the Word of God a chore to you? Is it hard to read the Bible? Do you not like it? You have so many other things that you're trying to become besides a reflector of Jesus Christ. What's the problem? You don't see this as being valuable? Talk to me, somebody. This Word is gold, man. This Word. What does this look like to you? <laughs> what does it look like to you now? A bird. If you want to ascend. <sighs> I'll tell you, if you want to rise, this book and the God that's behind it will bring you to that expected end. So you pursue him doggedly. And you become like him. First you see him. And then you become like him. You see, God, you notice how you stare at the sun. If you look at the sun for a while and then you look elsewhere, you will still see the sun in whatever direction you turn. When you look at Jesus, when you peer into him, man, you will see him everywhere. They ask Jesus, what's the primary commandment? What's the first commandment? What did he say? He said, you love God. God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and the second is like unto it you love your neighbor 
as you love yourself. The love that you have for God is supposed to produce a love for people. I, I remember the first time I got this revelation. As I come to a close, I, I was in seminary, and uh, uh, I was in seminary, and we were reading uh, about a whole bunch of historical stuff, and um, we, were, we were learning about the image of God, because we were made in the image and after the likeness of God. And it showed me that that word that's used for image and likeness is the word selim. It's T-S-E-L-E-M, selim. And that was the same word that was used when Nebuchadnezzar made that image. He made that golden statue that was supposed to, to show that he had ownership of the region. God made you man, to showcase his glory. He made you as an image bearer to be to the earth what he is to the heavens. And I remember I was driving home from work one day and I saw a man that was in front of a liquor store and he was drunk as a skunk and swimming in his own leftovers, just swimming in all this vomit. And a tear fell down my cheek. And I said, sell him. I'm not just looking at some poor, miserable uh, drunk. I'm looking at somebody who's made in the image and after the likeness of God. And look what the devil has done to him. Look what Satan has done to God's image. And that's how you're supposed to love. Not to throw money at stuff out of pity. But you recognize the dignity that's in people. And you try to bring it out. Just as Christ did. Seeking those who are lost. Saving them. And so you become, you look at Jesus in the word, and you become. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it talks about how, this is verses 16 through 18, right around there. We, by beholding Jesus Christ, we become transformed into that image. <sighs> by looking at him, by peering into that image, we become. What do you see? When you look at the Jesus Christ in the Bible, what stands out to you? See, Jesus, man, t for me, Jesus is such a perfectly balanced personality. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to pinpoint one thing that stands out. When I look at Job, I look at his patience, man. Uh, when I look at Abraham, I look at his faith. Uh, when I look at David, I look at his, his, his courage, man, that warrior spirit that he had. But Jesus was just so beautiful, man just so well-rounded in his righteousness that it's kind of hard to just pinpoint one thing that stands out with him. But if I had to do it, I would say his fearlessness and his compassion. His fearlessness and his compassion. Mm. He was both moved and unmoved by problems. In other words, he saw a problem. He saw sickness. He saw disease. He saw storms. He saw death. And he was unmoved in the sense that he was never intimidated by a problem. But he was moved in the sense where whenever he saw somebody who was downtrodden, whenever he saw somebody that was without, whenever he saw somebody that was hanging their head low, he felt like he had to do something. Nobody ever came to Jesus Christ with the need and left empty-handed. And so that's the Jesus Christ that I see in the Word. And that's the reflection. That's the image. That's what I want to become, man. That, that's, that's the ambition of my life, to, to reflect Him. That nobody can enter into my company and, and be unchanged. I see somebody who's, who's, a, who's, who's a drug addict. I see somebody who's a prostitute. And I, and, and I dream like God. We, we, he calls us saints in the word. And how many of us know we ain't no saints as far as how we live? Which one of us can say we really live as saints? But God has that spiritual imagination. He calls you a saint even though you're not living like one. Because Jesus, he believes. He believes. He chooses you because he believes in what you become. He doesn't just love you for what you are right now. He loves you and he's interested in you because of what he knows you can become. And my final point, 
I was watching um, a video. A psychiatrist was talking about how we have people who are rich and people who are poor and the way that rich and poor people respond to crises and problems. And he said that he saw that when poor people would get into a jam, it's like it's over. You know, they hit rock bottom and they never come up again. But he said with rich people, he noticed that they always seem to come out. And, he was, and they asked him, you know, what, what, is, what is the reason behind this phenomenon? He said because rich people, most of the time, they come from successful households, successful environments. And they just, because of how they were raised, because of the environment that they were in, because of what they saw day after day, they just had an optimism about life. That when their parents got into a jam, somehow, some way, they always came out of it. And so because that picture was constantly repeated in their mind, when things happened to them, when adversity came to them, when they were grown up, when they were adult, they just had this built-in confidence that things were going to work out. And they asked the man, well, if poor people have this defect, is, that, is this a permanent thing? Can they come out of it? He said, yes, they can come out of it. He said, by immersion. Hmm. By just continually being, just, absor just being absorbed in what is positive. Being absorbed in what is good. As a Christian, I say, being absorbed in the word. You, you meditate upon that word. Well, I don't know how to meditate upon the word. Do you know how to worry? <laughs> Come on. How many of us know how to worry? I'm sure many of us are very successful worriers. The same thing that you do when you're worried, what are you doing? Oh my God, my kids are going to die. Oh, they're going to die before their time. Oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I don't know how I'm going to pay for my kids going to college. The same way you rehearse that trash in your mind over and over and over again until it becomes real, even though it's fake. That's what you do with the word. You just let it roll around. <laughs> You just let that thing roll around until, man, you be like Solomon. Last thing I'll say to you. God was able to visit him in a dream where he couldn't fake it. So what do you want, man? He said, I just want to be able. <laughs> I just want to be a successful tool in your hands. I just want wisdom to be able to do what you have called me to do. God says, access granted. And because he was able to get the main thing, God could entrust him with everything else. You delight yourself, come on y'all, in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Anything that you want, you can have it, but you have to be transformed from the image of stupid to the image of Christ. <laughs> All right, I'll leave you on that note. Saints, I thank you for listening as long as you did. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. All right. <clears throat> if you'd like to give, we have uh, the offering bucket here. We also have our cash app, which is 508-389-3586. Uh, uh, Pastor Adewale will come up and close us and bless us. Uh, if you weren't here, uh, it's, it's uh, Brother Mitch's birthday. So if we can go ahead and sing a song for him, happy birthday. And afterwards, we will uh, enjoy some cupcakes if you're interested. Okay. All right, Pastor Ottawa. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Pastor Emmanuel Aju. can you give God a clap offering? I just felt if we want to clap for God, we shouldn't do it in a common way. And I felt if it's God we want to clap for, we should stand up and show in a little respect. Let it be loudest. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor Emmanuel. You can have your seat for the teaching. It's wonderful. I'm blessed. And I believe you are blessed too. Many things you have to fight in this world. Those things you got to know that you are wrong 
and you call it past, fighting your past. And preparing for more wrong that will come, which are the battle for the future. And because of God's love, courage, and grace, yes, we are strong and happy. Let's stand on our feet. I want us, uh, Brother Mitch, today is exact day you were born or you matching up? Or was today, the Sunday, the, your right date is today, right? Today. Wow. It's not every Sunday that if we celebrate his birthday. But it happened to be on Sunday today, the last day, the day that people were able to gather together to fellowship. So I want you to pray for him. That let God establish him in his presence forever. In the name of Jesus, Father, we pray for Brother Nietzsche. Lord, that you establish in your kingdom, in your word, in your will forever. In the name of Jesus, you will bless him, you will bless his household. You will bless his new age, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Lord, the remaining days of his life shall be in peace. Shall be fulfillment. Increase. In Jesus' name. Lord, you fight his battle for him. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. We are going to sing two songs for you to celebrate you. Because many people don't know that I'm a Portuguese. I'm, I'm not English. <laughs> Amen. So we sing in Portuguese, and we sing in English to celebrate. Can we sing for you in English? Well, happy birthday to you. Day to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. We wish you many happy returns of the days. Long life and prosperity. Amen. Do you have any person celebrating birthday this month? Also, match any person of match match children? No. Hey, mine was last month. Oh, last month. Oh, we celebrated together. We shared the same month. Welcome to February. Amen. So we are now we speak. Sing to for Brother Mitch in Portuguese. Maybe he has never heard that before. That may be the first time. But we sing happy, happy birthday in Portuguese. And my Portuguese people will help me to, to sing that for him. Parabéns pra você nessa data querida. Muitos felicidade. Muitos anos de vida. Amen. May God continue to bless you mightily in Jesus' name. We celebrate you. God bless you. Let's pray. Uh, after the meeting, Pastor Emmanuel has prepared a surprising cake, right? Oh, cupcake. So if you love cake, and if you wouldn't mind the coffee, I can make you one. Amen. So a cake and coffee to balance the meal. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today, for your world, for the joy in your presence. For your grace. Lord, the Bible says in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 that if we want a good success, God said we meditate day and night. Every moment. Lord, as we are living this place, we live with your presence continually in our lives. Meditating your word and being prospered. The Bible says sent forth this word he healed them. Lord, that we shall apply your word to any area of our life that needs correction, healing, deliverance, and perfection. In the name of Jesus. Lord, this week we shall prosper. Anything that is waiting on our way to challenge, to frustrate, to stop, to batter, to defeat, Lord, we cancel them now, we destroy them now, we trash them now. In the name of Jesus, we ask for your favor to go with us. We ask your presence to always be with us and our family. We pray for all our family members that devil, enemy, or they themselves are confused. They were in a situation or the other that they need help. Lord, help them. Stretch forth your hand to them. Deliver them from every mystery, from every problem, from every frustration, from death, from sickness. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's share the grace in fellowship together. The grace of our Lord share like a champion. The love of God and fellowship of Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, the message shall follow me all the days of our lives. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. One more time. Surely, I want you to say that surely as you deem it, I mean, you know. Surely, let's start again. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.